Okay, hello and welcome to our 13 hour seminar of the Centre of Research Excellence in Aphasia Recovery and Rehabilitation. I'm Dr. Sonia Brownset, a research fellow here at the CRE and co-facilitator of the seminar series. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that this event and many of our participants today are located on the land of the traditional custodians in Australia. Today, I'm speaking to you from the land of the Torrible people. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future and extend this respect to any First Nations people joining us here online today. Today, we're delighted to have Dr. Samuel Harvey joining us from the University of Queensland. Sam recently completed his PhD here at the CRE and will present his work on examining the role of treatment dose in post-stroke aphasia. Before I formally introduce Sam, I'm just going to briefly cover some housekeeping. If you haven't done so already, please do join us as a member of the Aphasia CRE community of practice. We welcome people with aphasia, their family, friends, health professionals, researchers and organisations to our Aphasia CRE community of practice. The CRE is always looking for financial support, so if you wish to donate, please see our website for details. Please do note that this seminar is being recorded for future viewing. You can connect with us on social media via Twitter and Facebook. And as always, please feel free to tweet along with today's seminar using the hashtag AphasiaCRE. You can find past webinar videos on the Aphasia CRE website. Just click on the resources tab. And the Aphasia CRE also now has a YouTube channel where you can access past seminar recordings. So you can subscribe to that to receive notifications about new videos if you prefer. Now, hopefully this seminar will spark lots of questions. You can write your questions in the question and answer function on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen, rather than the chat box. Enter your question for Sam at any time throughout the presentation. You'll also be able to see the questions that have been asked by other audience members. You can then like or upvote a question to show those which are most interest, of most interest to the group. At the end of the presentation, Sam will answer as many questions as time will allow. Please reserve this Q&A space for questions only and keep your questions brief and no comments, please. So now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Samuel Harvey. Sam is a speech pathologist and postdoctoral research fellow in the Queensland Aphasia Research Centre and is an affiliate researcher with the CRE for Aphasia Recovery and Re Rehabilitation. Sam has over 10 years experience working as a speech pathologist with adults who live with the consequences of brain injury. Sam's doctoral thesis focused on the question of how the amount of treatment a person with aphasia receives affects recovery of language and communication after a stroke. Sam is a member of the collaboration of aphasia trialist, dose and intensity working group. He's an early career researcher representative for the International Collaboration Network of N of One Trials and Single Case Designs. He is an ambassador with the IMNIS Catalyst Program and an ambassador for Open Science Practices in Speech and Language Pathology with CS Disseminate. He is currently working on a number of aphasia, re of aphasia research projects here at the Queensland Aphasia Research Centre, aiming to improve the consistency of care that people with aphasia receive. So I'd like to hand over to you now, Sam. Thank you for joining us today. We're looking forward to hear your talk. Thanks very much, Sonia, for the introduction. And uh, thank you also to the CRE for the invitation to come and speak today. It's a real um, honour to be here talking to you about something that I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about, and I'm excited to share um, the products of the, the work from my PhD. I'm, uh, I'm presenting to you today from Gubby Gubby country on Queensland's Sunshine Coast, and I pay my respects to the elders past and present and emerging leaders of the traditional owners of these lands, waters and skies, and I acknowledge the enduring contributions of First Nations people here and around Australia. The work I'm presenting today was undertaken during my uh, doctoral studies, and I'd like to acknowledge and thank these stellar individuals, Professors Miranda Rose and Michael Walsh Dickey, and Dr. Marcella Carraher for their contribu uh, contributions to this work. 
Um, I anticipate that um, in the audience today, we'll have some clinicians, some researchers, um, maybe some people with lived experience of aphasia attending. And I really hope that my presentation will have something of interest for everyone. Aphasia impacts every aspect of a person's life. And the aphasia CRE is funded to tackle the highest priorities in aphasia research. Central to the advancement of aphasia care is the enhancement of treatment effectiveness. People with aphasia, caregivers, health professionals agree that this is the number one research priority relating to aphasia following stroke. The amount of treatment a person receives, the dose, probably influences recovery, but we don't know much about these so-called dose-response relationships, and particularly in the context of the complex interventions used to treat aphasia and its psychological and social consequences. There are many factors that may influence a, person, a person's recovery from aphasia. And while um, here are some of them, and while some factors like the, um, the size and site of a stroke um, appear to be strongly predictive of recovery, speech and language treatments may offer a relatively small boost to a person's overall recovery. But unlike factors like uh, stroke-related factors, treatment-related factors are modifiable. People with aphasia and um, clinicians have some control over these factors. And today we'll be exploring the role of treatment dose in aphasia recovery, and we'll consider implications for future aphasia research and clinical practice. So the, the fundamental question is, how much treatment does a person with aphasia need to get the best recovery of language skills and communication after having a stroke? There are three parts to today's presentation. In part one, I'll answer the question, what is dose? Part two concerns um, the evidence for the effect of treatment dose on aphasia recovery, and this will form the bulk of the presentation. And then um, towards the end, we'll look to the future of aphasia dose research. Okay, so what is dose in the context of these complex behavioral treatments we use in aphasia rehab? Broadly speaking, I'll, I'll define dose as the amount of treatment provided or received. And I differentiate this from the treatment schedule, which defines how the dose is distributed over time. At the outset of my PhD, we wanted to understand how treatment dose had been um, characterized in aphasia treatment research. So we conducted a scoping review to find out. And just a note, I use QR codes throughout this presentation that will take you to various websites. So have your phone handy. And also if for whatever reason you're unable to access the published version of a particular paper and you'd like to read it, please do get in touch via email and I can share open access versions of these publications. So in this scoping review, um, we reviewed 112 aphasia treatment uh, studies spanning 50 years of aphasia research. And most of these studies were small. They included 10 or fewer participants, and they were typically conducted in the chronic phase of recovery. That's six or more months post onset of aphasia. And these studies, typically um, investigated the efficacy or the effectiveness of impairment-focused interventions. Nearly all of these studies talked about dose in terms of the amount of time of treatment uh, provided. Um, and most studies also reported the number of sessions provided. And about a quarter of studies reported dose in terms of um, the activities that were undertaken during treatment in such a way that you could um, sort of come up with a cumulative total number of activities that were provided during the treatment phase. And a few studies um, reported a, a more nuanced uh, version of hours, which is time on task, where the participants were actively involved in, in treatment. So this tells us that um, the dose of an aphasia treatment is multidimensional. It's the time spent doing treatment and it's the activities performed by the therapy provider and recipient during that time. Those activities are the basic building blocks of treatment. And for an efficacious treatment, those activities contain the active ingredients, which are 
the actions that are presumed to enhance new learning and new behavior and are therefore linked to the underlying mechanisms of action of a particular treatment. This characterization of dose uh, aligns with clinical practice where clinicians typically talk about the number of hours or sessions of therapy provided, um, but we're also interested in the activities performed during that time. So we will count the number of repetitions of a particular task, for example. And when thinking about uh, what dose-related data we might be, uh, we might like to collect in order to examine the effect of dose on treatment outcomes. We can think of it like this. Time is easy to measure and compare. It's clinically relevant. It's easily understood by patients, families, healthcare providers, um, and it's the most commonly reported dose measure. But in terms of understanding dose-response relationships. Time may be inadequate because it lacks specificity. It assumes that all hours of treatment are the same, which is not true. And it potentially obscures underlying mechanisms and mechanisms of action because we don't necessarily know what's happening within therapy. On the other hand, characterizing, uh, characterizing dose in terms of activity is more refined. It's treatment specific. So for example, the therapy activities involved in semantic feature analysis are not the same as the activities used in treatment of underlying forms. And uh, as I mentioned, for an efficacious treatment, the therapy activities will contain the active ingredients, which may serve as empirical evidence of theorized uh, mechanisms of actions for a particular treatment. But examining or collecting data on therapeutic activities is labor intensive. And what we learn about dose response relationships in one treatment may not necessarily generalize to other treatments. So our scoping review demonstrated that dose is multidimensional and that there is some inconsistency in the conceptual, uh, conceptualization, and the measurement and the reporting of dose in aphasia treatment research. To advance our understanding of treatment response in aphasia rehabilitation research, we see the potential um, benefit of adopting a framework to guide this dose conceptualization, measurement, and reporting. To this end, a working group within the aphasia CRE uh, reviewed existing dose frameworks for their poten uh, potential application to aphasia rehabilitation research. And in this work, uh, we identified and compared three existing dose frameworks, and there was one standout in terms of its comprehensiveness and specificity of dose parameters. And that was the multidimensional dose articulation framework, um, which was developed by Kate Hayward and colleagues. This tool is helpful. It makes the multiple dimensions of dose uh, really clear. At the, at the macro level, there's the overall treatment duration. So for example, a person receives 12 weeks of therapy. And within that, treatment will be provided on one or more treatment days. And these can vary from week to week. So you could have a block of daily therapy followed by a block of weekly therapy, for example. Each treatment day, there'll be one or more treatment sessions, which are defined by their length in time. And then within sessions, there are these episodes that contain the active ingredients of therapy. In this study, we applied the multidimensional dose articulation framework to three uh, previously reported aphasia treatment studies, which span the ICF. And we demonstrated how this framework could be used to delineate dose parameters in these complex behavioral interventions. We found that, um, that describing the multiple dose dimensions, these multiple do dose dimensions of impairment-focused treatments was relatively straightforward, but the treatments focused on, um, on communication participation or targeting environmental factors may be a bit more difficult to accurately characterize um, using this framework because of the difficulty in identifying and delineating discrete episodes within these complex interventions. So there's more work to be done here. 
This work has been um, picked up by a group within the collaboration of aphasia trialists um, led by Professor Lucy Dipper. And this group is aiming to enhance reporting of aphasia clinical trials. They've developed a tidier aphasia checklist and they're currently seeking feedback um, regarding, among, among other things, the potential benefits and barriers to um, more detailed dose specification within aphasia uh, clinical trial reporting. The, I understand that the, cons the consultation period is due to close soon, so um, I encourage you to contribute your ideas while you can. So um, I think it's worth noting here that uh, the issues faced around dose conceptualization in aphasia are not unique. Uh, speech pathologists treat a wide array of communication and swallowing disorders across the lifespan. And anecdotally, uh, discussions I've had with experts in the fields of uh, developmental language disorder, swallowing rehab, transgender voice therapy, and pediatric and adult motor speech disorders have identified a ubiquitous need for improved specification and description of dose and uh, schedule parameters pertaining to these, area, uh, these areas of practice. So um, there appears to be an appetite to standardize dose conceptualization and, and terms across speech pathology areas of practice, which could bring many potential benefits. And the work that we've done to examine dose conceptual frameworks and applying these uh, to aphasia treatments might be relevant beyond aphasia. So dose is multidimensional at a gross level. It's the time spent in treatment at a granular level. It's the actions performed during that time. And it's my current belief that if we're to understand how aphasia treatments work and for whom, we need to keep this granular concept of dose in the forefront of our minds when examining dose response relationships. So what effect does dose have on treatment response in post-stroke aphasia? Here um, you can see a hypothetical response profile uh, for an unknown treatment. Um, basically, what this shows is that um, as the dose increases, the, the treatment response uh, improves to a certain point. The optimal dose of an effective treatment will be found somewhere within uh, the therapeutic range of doses for that treatment. The lower boundary of the therapeutic range is the point at which uh, a treatment effect is first detected, while the upper boundary uh, is the point at which no additional benefit is gained from continuing treatment. And in uh, pharmacology and radio-oncology, dose is usually limited by side effects. And when the side effects outweigh the benefits of treatment, this defines the maximum tolerable dose. Similarly, uh, in behavioral treatments like those used in aphasia, um, these treatments are likely to exhibit therapeutic dose ranges. But there are challenges that need to be solved um, identifying the boundaries of the therapeutic range for a particular aphasia treatment. At the lower end, things such as the selection of outcome measures used to determine uh, treatment response, particularly their sensitivity and specificity will be important. At the upper end, establishing uh, reliable measures of dose limiting side effects, such as boredom, and, and, and determining the point at which additional treatment fails to confer additional benefit um, will also be important. The key message here is that the research should be homing in on the optimal dose of aphasia treatments. So now I'll uh, briefly review dose-related aphasia literature, and then I'll describe an experimental dose comparison study we conducted, which aimed to hone in on that idea of optimal dosing. 20 years ago, Sanjeet Bogle and colleagues asserted that when it comes to the rehabilitation of aphasia, more treatment is better. They synthesized findings from eight randomized control trials, and they found positive treatment effects in studies that provided about 100, of our, 100 hours of treatment on average, whereas um, ineffective studies provided a total of about 45 hours of treatment. Although based on just a few studies, this work has been influential in setting targets for high-dose aphasia treatment 
and has uh, stimulated widespread discussion of treatment intensity, or in other words, how the dose is distributed over time. Uh, more recently, the 2016 Cochrane Review by Marion Brady and colleagues included 10 dose sub-analyses, which investigated the relative superiority of more or less treatment on a range of outcome measures. Uh, and for these sub-analyses, the authors meta-analyzed group level outcome data from six randomized control trials in which uh, the participants re received either a higher dose or a lower dose of treatment. Um, in those analyses, more treatment was favored on just two outcome measures, functional communication and written expression. But both of these findings came from a single randomized control trial, respectively. Uh, these analyses also showed that the lower dose condition was associated with better treatment adherence and fewer dropouts. And then last year, the release collaborators, again, uh, led by Marion Brady, published uh, this large scale network meta-analysis, uh, which examined relationships between dose and schedule parameters and treatment outcomes. Um, data from 959 participants in 25 randomized control trials were analyzed. And there were a number of interesting findings, including that the optimal recovery of overall language ability as measured on the Western aphasia battery um, was achieved or um, was observed uh, after 20 to 50 hours of functionally tailored um, receptive and expressive treatment that included home practice. The release study uh, provides a starting point for benchmarking dose and schedule parameters uh, for different treatment approaches and participant characteristics. And taken together, um, these reviews are valuable because they provide indications around where the therapeutic range of doses of aphasia treatment might lie. But interpretation is challenging. I'll just say that this isn't a criticism of these high quality reviews, nor is it a criticism of the studies included in the reviews. But in, retros in retrospect, knowing what we do about the potential value of greater specificity in treatment, dose measurement and reporting, three main limitations are evident. First, these syntheses and meta-analyses relied on data from studies that conceptualize dose as the number of hours of treatment rather than a more nuanced measure of dose. Where dose comparisons were made, these reviews compared dose response relationships across different amounts of different treatments. And lastly, the doses provided in the included studies were arbitrary in the sense that preliminary work establishing the optimal dose of specific treatments is non-existent, or at least it's not published. So we have no way of knowing if optimal doses of these treatments were applied in any of the included studies. If we accept, and you may not accept this, I'm open to discussion about this, but if we accept that the dose of a treatment is, um, that the dose is treatment specific, that dose is, is yoked to the active ingredients of a particular treatment, then what we stand to learn by comparing different amounts of different treatments before the optimal dose of those treatments has been established is questionable. So we dug into this a little bit. Um, the scoping review that I spoke about just a moment ago identified 15 studies that compared different amounts of a single intervention. In this study, uh, we synthesized findings from, from six of those studies, which met our methodological standards for inclusion. And I, I won't go into detail here, um, but our key findings were that increased dose may confer greater improvement in language and communication skills um, for some people with aphasia, um, but with diminishing returns over time. Uh, so what I mean here, for example, um, in the, the randomized control trial uh, from Germany led by Katarina Breitenstein, a sub-analysis of data from participants who effectively received a double dose of that um, intervention indicated that the second block of treatment resulted in additional improvement 
that was about 50% as much as the improvement seen after the first block of treatment. So there was improvement, but with diminishing returns. Um, we also found that synthesis of this small set of rigorously conducted study was, uh, studies was challenging uh, due to the different ways that dose was measured and reported across these studies. So based on what I presented so far, here are some considerations for future dose investigations. Dose is multidimensional. Exploration of dose effects should aim to systematically manipulate and control uh, dose parameters of interest. And the multidimensional dose articulation framework might be useful in designing, conducting, and reporting dose studies. Um, dose is treatment specific. Uh, we need to explore dose effects within and not between treatments unless we have a solid under understanding of the therapeutic range of doses and ideally the optimal dose of the comparison treatments. Or alternatively, it may be possible to employ highly sophisticated study designs that allow comparison across doses and treatments um, in order to simultaneously establish both therapeutic ranges and relative effectiveness of the comparison treatments. I have no experience with these methods, but I know that some members of the collaboration of aphasia trialists are actively looking into these possibilities. Uh, the fourth point, uh, the third point here, sorry, is aphasia treatments probably exhibit therapeutic ranges. But in practical terms, the amount of treatment that a person receives tends to be limited by time. There's a finite amount of practice a person can do in a given amount of time. And perhaps that forms the upper boundary of the therapeutic range for many aphasia treatments. And about three years ago, in the early stages of my PhD, I thought a good place to, to begin exploring dose response relationships is with single case methodologies in which uh, dose parameters could be tightly controlled and the effects and moderators of a relatively common or simple aphasia treatment could be examined. So we use these principles to guide the development of a novel dose comparison methodology. And I'll now spend a bit of time uh, talking, describing this pilot study we conducted. Just a heads up, it gets a little bit dense here. So um, perhaps just take a breather. I'm going to have a sip of water. So first step was to select a common aphasia treatment target. Um, we, we selected anomia, which just about everybody who has aphasia experiences. We selected a common anomia treatment, in this case, acute picture naming treatment, which I'll describe in detail shortly. And we chose to explore how the number of episodes of cued picture naming treatment a person receives influences uh, their anomia recovery. Participants were recruited into an 18-week study, uh, which comprised pre-treatment language and cognition tests, a four-week multiple baseline study, which included three weeks of treatment and follow-up naming tests. The primary outcome was picture naming accuracy on daily naming probes um, during the, the multiple baseline study. Um, and secondary outcomes were, were naming accuracy on the picture naming test. The picture naming test comprised um, pictures of 298 objects like these ones here. And uh, we analyze changes in picture naming accuracy uh, throughout treatment and at follow-up. Acute picture naming treatment um, has some evidence to support its use for the restoration of vocabulary in chronic aphasia. This is a, depi a depiction of one episode of cued picture naming treatment, uh, remembering that the episodes contain the activities conducted during a treatment session. An episode of this treatment begins when the clinician shows the person with aphasia a picture and then provides a series of cues uh, to elicit the name of the picture. And each time a cue is provided, the person with aphasia has an opportunity to name the picture. And regardless of their success, the next cue in the sequence is provided. There are eight cues, 
So the person with aphasia has eight opportunities to name the picture each episode. And this episode structure is identical every time a new picture is presented. The active ingredients of this treatment are the presentation of the picture, which stimulates semantic representations and lexical semantic representations, uh, the provision of cues, um, which facilitates lexical retrieval, and naming attempts, which elicit verbal production of the target word. So you can see this is a highly structured and a relatively simple lexical retrieval treatment that we selected here. The study was conducted during pandemic lockdowns, so the treatment was delivered online over Zoom, which was relatively straightforward. We provided three weeks of daily treatment um, and sessions included 45 minutes of time on task. We manipulated the number of episodes provided each session. There were three treatment conditions, low dose, moderate dose and high dose. Uh, and each was treated for one week in the multiple baselines study. We calibrated these different doses by adjusting the episode length. Um, so uh, a longer episode length results in fewer episodes per session and therefore a lower dose. And conversely, shorter episode length results in a higher dose. So we adjusted the episode length by adjusting the naming opportunity duration. First, we identified the maximum number of episodes we could fit into a session for a given partic uh, participant. And this maximum was determined by an individual's picture naming response time um, during pre-treatment testing. So the dose was personalized to each individual. Under the low dose condition, each picture was treated once per session. Um, uh, that is, there was one episode per picture per session, and that resulted in 40 naming opportunities across the week of treatment. Under the moderate dose condition, each picture was treated twice per session. And under the high dose condition, each picture was treated three times per session. Um, importantly, each, um, each dose condition had a separate set of pictures and there was a fourth set of pictures uh, which was left untreated. We used a multiple baselines design. Uh, so during the treatment period, we monitored picture naming accuracy on all of the allocated pictures each day for four weeks. Um, in week one, there was no treatment, all picture sets were in baseline. And here you can see the proportion of pictures named accurately each day uh, across the four treatment conditions. Uh, then in week two, the first treatment set was introduced and the other three sets remained untreated. In week three, we stopped treating the first set and introduced the second set. Then in week four, the last treatment set was introduced. Right, so that's the experimental setup. Um, now to the results. Four people with chronic post-stroke um, aphasia were recruited from the community in 2021. They ranged in age, they came from diverse ethnic, educational and occupational backgrounds, they had varied aphasia type and severity, and they had a range of co-occurring cognitive, sensory and motor deficits. Assessment one, uh, sorry, analysis one uh, estimated the likelihood of accurately na uh, accurate naming for individual pictures throughout treatment. And we use mixed effects models to compare changes in naming accuracy for treated pictures against changes in accuracy for untreated pictures. In order to demonstrate a treatment effect, the magnitude of improvement in naming of treated items needed to far out, um, exceed any changes in, in naming accuracy on untreated items. And it's worth noting that all four participants improved naming accuracy for untreated items. And we consider that this is an effect of um, daily exposure to these, uh, to these pictures throughout the multiple baselines study. This chart here, it's a bit complicated and a little blurry, but it shows the odds ratio. So that's the likelihood of successful naming over unsuccessful naming after each treatment session um, of each dose condition versus the untreated condition. 
In short, um, treatment effects were evident for three of the four participants. Uh, the, the treatment effects accrued over time. So you can see that there's um, an increase in the odds ratio over time for uh, most of these participants. Um, and a number of factors, uh, there seems to be a superiority of the high dose condition for those three participants who responded. And a number of factors um, help us to understand variability in dose response relationships observed across these participants. To examine maintenance, uh, we use similar methods, but with the data um, from the, the pre, post and follow up picture naming test. Um, but there was no consistent or significant maintenance of the improvements in namings that we saw um, during treatment relative to the untreated pictures for, for any of these participants. So this was a pilot methodological study uh, in which modest treatment effects were observed but not maintained. The results provide some evidence of the possible superiority of higher doses of this particular treatment for some people with aphasia, but we'd certainly want to see more data before feeling confident we, that we'd observed a true effect there. The method we developed and tested is one way to experimentally compare doses of a single intervention. And we found that the multiple, uh, sorry, that the the, the multi-dimensional dose articulation framework was helpful in conceptualizing how to control for and to experimentally manipulate dose parameters within our study. Using this experimental design, it'd be feasible to manipulate other dose parameters, such as the overall duration or the number and spacing of treatment days or sessions each week, while still um, tightly controlling the provision of episodes and active ingredients of, of the treatment um, that, that's under scrutiny. This, uh, this method could also be applied to other impairment focused interventions, we think, um, both within aphasia and perhaps in speech pathology areas of practice beyond aphasia. In terms of the limitations of this pilot si uh, study, other than its small size, Importantly, people with aphasia should be centrally involved in the development, the implementation, the evaluation, and the dissemination of future dose-related research. The qualitative or mixed methods exploring the opinions of people with lived experience of aphasia, and particularly regarding questions of dose and schedule, including their preferences and um, therapy tolerance should be conducted and uh, research examining uh, dose response relationships should ideally prior prioritize treatments that are likely to result in generalization and maintenance of clinically meaningful outcomes. So uh, treatment dose is an important part of the complex aphasia recovery puzzle. And the work I've presented today um, provides a refined understanding of what constitutes dose in complex aphasia uh, treatments. And, um, and we provided a method for systematically examining uh, dose effects within impairment-focused treatments. Greater understanding of dose response relationships in post-stroke aphasia will be achieved using various methods. The small-scale experimental studies like ours provide the opportunity to examine person and um, treatment related factors that might mediate dose response relationships. And these findings should inform uh, larger scale group designs. While uh, coming from the other end, meta-analyses of, um, of existing research offers population level inferences of dose response relationships. And in the future, the application of more sophisticated studies designs may speed up progress in this area. More treatment is probably better for most people with aphasia, but people do not typically receive enough treatment. And we know this from a number of different sources. As an example, um, Rob Kavanagh and colleagues in the US exposed a, a disconnect between the doses found to be effective in aphasia research studies and doses provided in clinical practice in, in their part of the US. And it's possible, it's maybe even probable, that many people with aphasia receive too little treatment to elicit potential gains, and that's something that must change. 
supplementing face-to-face -face treatment with digital interventions and self-management strategies is a relatively simple and cost-effective way to increase opportunities to practice language and communication. Um, and, and this could be implemented now in many uh, uh, rehabilitation services. As mentioned earlier, um, work is underway, looking to enhance dose description in aphasia research. And I also touched on the potential benefit of improved consistency of dose conceptualization uh, measurement and reporting across the discipline of speech pathology. Um, also, ICAPS, I haven't uh, talked about today, but um, intensive comprehensive aphasia programs provide a very promising model for aphasia recovery. And with a view towards ICAP optimization, um, as we learn more about dose response relationships for specific impairment focused and functional treatments used in ICAPS, we could use this knowledge to finely tune therapy programs for individuals with aphasia uh, based on their personal characteristics and other determinants or predictors of treatment response. And, and in so doing, um, we may be able to optimize the potential for recovery of language and communication after ICAP participation. Uh, getting close to the end now, and my voice is clapping out. Um, clinical decision support tools. So in clinical practice, uh, clinicians and patients make decisions regarding the type, the timing, and the amount of treatment required uh, to achieve specific goals. <clears throat> Uh, evidence to support, oh, excuse me. <laughs> All right, I'll see if I can make it to the end. Uh, evidence to support um, decision-making around dosing and scheduling is emerging. Uh, and uh, existing decision support making tools like uh, the Australian Aphasia Recovery Path uh, Rehabilitation Pathway, for example, um, they include lots of information about um, many aspects of aphasia rehabilitation, but as yet they provide no detail regarding the appropriate dose of specific treatments. But as we learn more about the interacting factors that mediate treatment response, uh, including dose and schedule, then this information should be embedded within these existing guidelines and uh, decision support tools. And finally, uh, ongoing international collaboration involving researchers, clinicians, people with lived experience of aphasia, um, health policy decision makers, healthcare administrators, funding bodies, will be pivotal to implementing more sophisticated research capabilities and hopefully to answer some of the more nuanced questions regarding which dose of which treatment is best for whom. I'm optimistic that a future exists in which uh, enhanced understanding of the interaction between personal characteristics and different treatments, doses and delivery schedules will provide greater certainty regarding aphasia recovery and greater choice regarding treatment options for clinicians and people living with aphasia. Thank you again very much for the opportunity to speak today and for your attention. I look forward to responding to some questions. Thank you so much, Sam. As you know, that's a topic that I'm particularly interested in. Um, and so it was really lovely to see your work from your PhD and see the, the, the rigor that we really need to start applying more broadly across the field, I think. Um, we've got a couple of questions, um, but while we get hopefully a few more coming through, I'm going to uh, take the opportunity to ask you one. Um, so you said that dose response is what it, from one treatment may not and probably won't generalise to other treatments, right? And given that as a field, we do have a lot of treatments that we deliver to people with aphasia, given the broad spectrum. And um, what are your thoughts on where we are as a field in terms of moving forward to, to investigate those different doses? Um, it's a great question. I think I would qualify that in terms of, you know, the potential for generalization across treatments. Um, in the study that I described in our, um, our pilot study, the active ingredients were showing a picture, providing cues and allowing the person with aphasia um, to have the opportunity to say the name of the picture. 
those ingredients are actually common across lots of lexical retrieval treatments, right? And so if they are truly active ingredients, if they are what's helping a person to recover vocabulary, then maybe um, what we learn in, say, semantic feature analysis or acute picture naming treatment may actually um, inform uh, the other treatments potentially. Um, I, I think that um, yeah, aphasia being as complex as it, as it is, that it affects every aspect of a person's life, that intensive comprehensive aphasia programs are the way to go and that we should really be looking at what's happening within those programs and potentially trying to tighten up various aspects of the, of the therapies that are delivered there. Um, also, I think, you know, the identification of these active ingredients in different treatments is a process that is sort of being undertaken now. And I'd be interested to see um, a list of the active ingredients of aphasia treatments. You know, I'd love someone to do that work um, to identify the potential active ingredients. And then we could go about systematically um, controlling for and manipulating those ingredients to see what effect they have on treatment response. Yeah, so a lot of work for us to do as a field, but we're making we're making steps in the right direction. I would think so. Yeah, cool. Okay, well, please do ask your questions um, in the question answer box, but I've got a few there that I'm going to pose to you now, Sam, if that's okay. Um, first of all, Hannah here at the Queensland Aphasia Research Centre says, thank you, Sam, that was wonderful. From your work, how do you think dose could be conceptualised within participation functional interventions? What are your thoughts on that? It's a wonderful question. And we touched a little bit on this in our paper examining dose effects, uh, sorry, examining dose frameworks. Um, it's really challenging and it will depend on the on the intervention, I suspect. Um, you know, there, there's a bit of a continuum from impairment focused into participation, I suppose. And for interventions that are sort of stepwise, like you might start at a word level and then up to a phrase sentence and working towards discourse and then embedding that discourse into a communicative exchange, I think you can probably identify those discrete episodes along the way. And then by the time you get to a communicative exchange, you've got a very clear idea of what those active episodes are doing um, in that context. So I think that's one potential. And I think, you know, there, um, there are a couple of um, candidate therapies um, that have been published recently that um, would suit that kind of dose characterization really nicely. Um, it remains to be seen for very complex, multifaceted, um, participation or environmental sort of targeting um, approaches, whether taking this, this reductionist approach to dose conceptualization will bear any fruit whatsoever. It may be that if you can't identify what those parts are, well, let's just talk about time spent or perhaps um, some other metric of, you know, how we measure the, the time spent doing the treatment. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not arguing that we need to take this um, this granular approach to everything that we do. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, and another question from Hannah. Um, in an ICAP, how do you think we can enhance our monitoring of dose other than number of therapy hours? Um, great question. I think some people are doing this already. Um, you know, if you're using a computer-based um, therapy delivery system, um, then you can capture, you know, the number of turns that a person has, the number of times a picture has been shown, that kind of thing. Clinicians routinely make notes. I, I've spoken to lots of clinicians around Australia over the last few years about how they kind of track what they're doing within a therapy session. And cl clinicians routinely uh, either have a table or scribble out um, on scrap paper how many times a task has been done, how many repetitions and response accuracy and that kind of thing. And then they transfer that data into a file, um, you know, into the patient's record. So I think that we're kind of, we kind of do this already. Um, being systematic about it just means uh, knowing specifically what it is that you're looking for for a particular treatment and setting up a system that allows you to collect that data without it hindering your ability to do the therapy. Yeah, and that's absolutely crucial because you don't want that to detract from the dose ultimately. Um, that's right. A, a question from Kerry Corley. So she says, hello from London. 
Thank you for getting up so early, Carrie. Um, I agree that digital technologies are an important tool increasing dose towards therapeutic levels given the limitations in aphasia services. However, in evaluating these, the self-derived formats mean we lose control of dose and even what a session is if participants can pick up, pause and put down therapies whenever convenient for them and take varied break lengths. What would you keep in mind when applying the MDAF to evaluate in a digital therapy with self-delivered dose? Big question. Yeah. Hi, Kerry. <laughs> Hi in London. It's early, I understand. Um, thank you very much for your question. Look, I think that's great. I think it's awesome that um, when people are doing self-managed therapy, they do it on their terms. I think that's fantastic. And if that, you know, at the end of my talk, I, I sort of envisage this future where people can choose how they do therapy. It might not make a great deal of difference whether or not you do an intensive block or if you spread it out over a, a vast amount of time. We don't have that data yet to you know support claim either way for, for most treatments that are applied. So it might come down to what the person who's doing the treatment prefers. And anyhow, you know, if it's a if it if if the treatment's delivered online or through an app, um, perhaps there is some way of gathering data on what uh, activities were undertaken during that time. Uh, also, you know, the start time, the end time of session, so you could get a sense of how the dose was distributed over time. Um, I'd be really happy to talk to you about specific situations and so on um, if if you're thinking of something specific. Uh, but yeah, I you know I don't have a um, I don't have all the answers here, but I think that uh, it's terrific when people can self-manage and I think we should be encouraging that. You know, aphasia is a chronic health condition and we need to be um, treating it as such. We need to be con considering it as such. And it means that um, self-management, just like with asthma and diabetes, should form a, a major part of a person's recovery. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, Kerry. Um, we have another question here from Katerina Brainstein. Um, also, thank you for joining us so early. Um, but she says, thank you for a great talk. Do you have data on how many, how much of the participants enjoyed the different dose conditions? Paul Conroy's study published in Brain in 2019 suggests that speeded, the speeding of naming tasks may increase the participants' motivation and therefore the attention. What are your thoughts on that? Great question. Uh, thank you, Katarina. I'm so pleased that you're here for this talk today. I'm really chuffed. Um, your work has been really influential in my thinking. Uh, I'm certainly um, familiar with Paul Conroy's study that you're referring to. And look, I have anecdotal evidence just through conversations that I had with the participants in my study. Um, and people loved it. Like they received 99% of the dose that was prescribed. They attended every session and they wanted to do more of it. Um, so I think um, it was motivating you've got to think about um, who's participating in research. They're probably already quite motivated. Um, but yes, I'm I'm interested to, and in our uh, in our write-up of that pilot study, we do explore some of the the um, cognitive factors that might um, predispose a person to doing well with this kind of treatment. Um, and yeah, I think that certainly it's not for everybody. Um, but it didn't appear to put people off. Um, the, the best way to get at your question would be to, to use mixed methods, I think, you know, and getting opinions of people along the way regarding um, what it's like to participate in these studies. Even better than that would be to co-design the studies with people with lived experience of aphasia so that they can tell you up front what's going to be important to them and um, and then you can just design your study that way. Brilliant, great, great answer. Um, there's no more questions just yet, but um, maybe some will come through. So I'm just gonna ask another question. I quite like this position. Um, so if moving forward, we can show that we have optimal doses. So I'm thinking about your lovely diagram that you had where you, um, there's a, there was a circle of optimal dose and then beyond a certain point there was no advantage. Um, so if we can show that there is an optimal dose for each therapy that we deliver, 
Um, that also means that we have a suboptimal dose, right, which was in, inherent in your picture. What are your thoughts on what that means for us as clinicians in terms of delivering a dose that we know to be suboptimal? Uh, I think this is what drove me to do a PhD, <laughs> was this um, sort of bugging thought in the back of my mind that I wasn't actually providing the therapy that people needed to, you know, optimize their recovery. It's really, you know, uh, it's about providing an opportunity to maximize recovery. It's not about maximizing recovery. It's about providing an opportunity to maximize recovery. And look, in the clinical context that I was working in prior to doing the PhD, <clears throat> uh, I don't know that it was set up to provide the sorts of doses that I think would be really effective um that's a hunch that i have it's i think it's um you know there are ethical issues around providing treatment that you know not to be effective but we don't know necessarily that there are these suboptimal doses being provided and so on i think it's something that we need to carefully examine um and you know i'm i'm also interested in other people's thoughts on this um certainly way i think we've just got to turn to dose augmentation you know whatever we can do to increase the opportunities for practice for getting people back into the activities that they're interested in participating in and get you know language exposure that way and ultimately just sort of getting on with life i agree I agree um just before we bring it to an end we've got one more question from hannah but i think ha actually hannah's sat with a group of people here in the queensland aphasia research center so i think they're from the group not just hannah um but she's asking what other elements of learning do you think may be important for treatment effectiveness oh wow i mean this is big uh, <laughs> i can imagine kira shigan sitting dr shigan sitting there thinking about this one um look i think there there are many factors that will influence a person's recovery here and the effectiveness of these treatments, um, look, specifically to different elements of learning. Um, well, in, in our pilot study, certainly um, people that were, um, oh, now I'm just trying to think back to the specifics of our, our four participants, there were people who, um, had certain executive control um, abilities and disabilities that uh, perhaps inhibited their ability to attend to tasks and so on for prolonged periods of time, although that didn't affect them from actually participating, perhaps that might be related to how they encode and uh, store and retrieve um words in in a learning paradigm like the one that we set up but ours our study wasn't really set up for that so um yeah interested in other people's ideas about about learning as well thank you very much sonia and thank you to everyone for um for attending today and for the questions brilliant thank you so much sam it was absolutely delightful talk to listen to um, so thank you for, for speaking and thank you to the um, audience for attending and for those great questions. Um, just to bring your attention for our next CRE seminar, we'll be hearing from Dr. Alexi Sivnon from the University of Helsinki. And he's going to be presenting to us on music-based interventions in neurological and aphasia rehabilitation. So this seminar is going to take place on Wednesday, June the 28th. Um, so do follow us on Twitter and via our community of practice for details of how to register for the seminar. Thanks again and see you then.